If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another Multifamily Monday episode. I'm your host, Sean Winslow, and this is the Multifamily Money Podcast. What's going on, everybody? You know the drill. Coming at you all things multifamily real estate investing on Mondays. And today, I've got a really special guest and a really special show. I'm not going to take up too much time um, in this intro because he he gives us his whole story. It's a very powerful and moving episode, um, episode on you know perseverance and just having a mindset of 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 not being a victim and and taking what life throws at you and it's it's not about it's not what happens to you but what happens for you and in this episode our guest really really hits home on that and you know it's a theme of being able to be flexible and again you know take what life throws at you and hit back and keep moving forward, pivoting when you need to pivot, um, developing skills that can, that can take you through your entire life and give you the confidence to tackle new challenges because you know, you can always fall back on those skills if need be, not that you're going to, but just in the back of the mind, you know, you have those skills. Um, it's a very, very moving, moving episode and just, uh, you know, warning for those that are a little squeamish when you're talking about any type of, of medical procedure. Um, we do talk, we do talk about that briefly in the show. Um, cause our guest did have experience with, with surgery due to cancer. Um, so just a fair warning. If you do a little, get a little squeamish on that, when we get to that, you might want to, you might want to fast forward, but I would highly recommend, even if, even if you are that way, still listen to the show because there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, and I told you I'd keep this short. Um, and I'm probably not doing that, but this is a very powerful episode. I've heard him give this, um, this talk in person and it was powerful then and it was powerful hearing it again. So without further ado, here's my good friend, Brian Pitcher. Hey, Brian, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks man. Hey, I'm excited about you again. Yeah, you too, man. We, the last time I saw you was in person in Dallas. It's good to see you. Again. Good to see that that smile and face again. And I'm excited about this one. We talked about this right before I hit record. And and for for the listeners, um, Brian and I are in a mastermind together. Um, and one time he shared his story, which really moved me because um, it's a, a story of you know perseverance and not giving up and going after what you want and by doing so he created a wonderful life for him and his family. And so I want him to share that with others because even if it just helps one person, I think it's totally worth it. So Brian, without further ado, let's, let's take it from, let's take it from the beginning. Who is Brian? Is is my hair okay first? I think it's, Uh, I'm totally, I'm totally, maybe fluff it up a little. Totally teasing. Very good. (laughs) So, okay. So, um, I grew up in, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, went to high school there, um, um, ended up serving a Mormon mission down in Brazil, ended up in Utah after that. Um, I was doing, I did, uh, most of what most people don't know about me is that I actually uh, was on cheerleading scholarship all the way through college. It was a great, um, way to hang out with all the girls, be athletic and, um, had a great time. I ended up doing a stint with the Utah jazz stunt team for two years. So I blew out my shoulder, um, which during that time, uh, apparently I had a brain tumor and I didn't know it at that time, but it was benefiting me in a big way because it's the same thing that, uh, Andre, the giant had Tony Robbins has it, um, a bunch of other like really famous big people have it. Cause it's a, it's called acromegaly. It's a brain tumor uh, that causes your body to create too much human growth hormone. When you have this growth hormone, uh, when you get it after your growth plates close, it causes you to get just wider. But if you get it before your growth plates close, when you're younger, it causes you to become a giant, a giant, which, which is called gigantism. So Tony Robbins is 
the giant as well as uh, Andre the giant. Uh, but the other issue with this growth hormone, too much growth hormone is it causes all your internal organs to grow. It causes like your heart, your liver, your kidneys, like everything gets bigger than it should, which is why Andre the giant died of a heart attack at 43 because his heart grew faster than his heart valves could grow. Um, and so it's a, when you get this, it's a death sentence. When you get a brain tumor like I have, it's a death sentence unless you get it dealt with and can stop the growth of it. And so uh, for me, it was giving me a ton of extra human growth hormone while I was in college doing cheerleading. And so I was really strong and uh, I got accused of using steroids all the time. Bit, but just because I was so strong, but it was, if, as far as I was concerned, it was all natural. I mean, I was working my ass off and, but to give it, to give perspective, how that benefited me, uh, when I was doing cheerleading, I could hold one girl in this hand and one girl in this hand above my head. It was I called the double QP, like above my head. Um, weightlifting wise, um, I was weighing in about 175 pounds or so, and I could bench 315. I was squatting 425. I was deadlifting well over 500. Wow. Uh, I could, could power clean 250 pounds. Um, I was really, really strong. Um, and so when I, but when I blew out my shoulder in 2006, uh, I quit working out. And so all of that, but it's as if I was taking steroids or that growth hormone injections while, um, while I wasn't working out. So it went to all of my joints. And so when, when, when it was going to my joints and I wasn't working out, it gave me severe arthritis in all of my joints. So like when you would walk downstairs, like most people like do one foot in front of the other, right? Well, it was this as if I had 50 pounds on my back, on my back while I was walking around, except I didn't, it was one foot at a time. I put one foot and then catch up with the other one and one foot and catch up with the other one. If I did one at a time, it, it, it jarred my joints so much that it would, I would be in extreme pain. If I jumped from one step down to the floor, like most kids will do two or three and see if it hurts. But for me, with one, it would shock all my joints and it would be extremely painful. Um, I hobbled around like I was a man in my 80s uh, in pain. Like I just couldn't walk. But yet I wanted to push through and do snowboarding and do wakeboarding and surfing and that kind of thing. And then I'd be laid up for several days afterwards just in pain and I would hobble around and, you know, so I, I didn't know that there was something wrong. I thought that because of all of the, the bodybuilding and sports that I played in college, that my joints were just hurt and arthritis and everything. And so I just thought I needed to get back in shape again and, and get that in. But that was, uh, that, that wasn't the case. So kind of backtracking a little bit. So that was, I uh, graduated from college in 2005, ended up getting married to Brandy in 2006, blew out my shoulder at the end of 2005 with the Jazz. Um, while to, in 2003, I started to get my real estate license and I got into real estate, started selling a ton of homes. Um, and I, I read the Robert Kiyosaki's book, book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that kind of started me on that whole whole path of thinking differently. Mm -hmm. I knew when I was in college that I wouldn't get a degree in anything. I just, I, I mean, I knew I'd get a degree, but I knew I wasn't going to use it for anything afterwards. It was just, I was having a great time. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I get up when I'm having a great time and right. I'll figure out what I'm, I just needed to stay in long enough to figure out what I wanted to do. And at that time it was, I wanted to do real estate, but I thought the way to get into real estate was as a real estate agent. So, um, Anyway, fast forward several years, um, I started to do, uh, when the market started crashing 08 here in Salt Lake City, where, where I live, I started to get into short sell. And not because I wanted to be a great agent, because I want to be an investor. And so I thought, well, if I do all the short sales, I can sell these off to investors and list it again. I want to be on the investor side of the business. And so I started marketing and I started learning to get in these different groups and and get ahead of the crowd of what is going on right now, what is happening. And I would look all over the country and find out what was going on in different markets and apply it back to the one that 
I was at. See, where where am I at compared to them? Because we were a two year delay, but behind the Sun Belt states. So I was trying, you know, figuring things out, and I was uh, I started to flip homes as a byproduct of that um because i would find other people doing short sales and i was like i'll buy your deal dude and I'm, i do short sales so i understand the game you're playing and i'll give you the commission if i, I just want to buy the deal uh, or i would sell a property to somebody else and then i would double end it and i would help or i would i would double end the 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 front side and then get the listing on the back side but i would help them line up money and whatnot so it was a, it was a deal for me but i wasn't actually the investor on it and so I started doing all that and I started to where I was, you know, holding 50 to 60 short sell listings at any given time. And I was making more money than everybody else. I knew at that time, everybody else was going bankrupt. They were getting other jobs, but I was staying in the business. My average short sell transaction was four grand and I was closing about a hundred deals a year. So if you, if you could think back at that point in time, it was, it looks like you're doing amazing from a real estate agent perspective at that time, getting 400, 450 grand a year in commissions. But yet I had three employee, three assistants, uh, two buyer's agents and, and a short sale negotiator and marketing to pay for it. So after it all got whittled down, it was like 150 grand. Yeah would seem like that was a great amount of money at the time, but with how much I was working and, and the, the having each of my kids cost me 50 grand out of pocket at that time, one was born in 2007, the other was born in 2010. And just with the short sell and, and cause I did end up with several rental properties before the crash and I started selling everything off, ended up short selling two properties. And I was able to keep my own house and I was leaving for work before my kids got up. And I was coming home after they went to bed. Yeah. And that was the, the more common theme versus the rare. So I was working 16, 18 hours a day, six days a week, because I, I was negotiating all my short sales during bank hours. But then I was going on all my, all my appointments uh, in the on evenings and on the weekend. Luckily, Utah uh, is, is very Mormon very religious. So most people take Sundays off, but, um, so luckily I had Sundays off, but I would still work Sundays too. Sometimes if I needed to, anyway, what I was, what I'm getting at is I was working my, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. And then, and in my brain, I'm using the same thought process of, I'm going to do what no one else is willing to do for five years so that I can live my life the way that nobody else can for the rest of my life. You ever hear that? Yeah. That one? Yeah. That same? That one. Okay. I, I think it's fucking lying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, and I'm going to tell you why. For some people that might work. Okay. But what if you don't have five years? What if you only have two years left and you spent those two years sacrificing everything and you don't even get to the end? What if at five years we have a market shift and all of a sudden you got to give another five years to it and that five years become 10 years and you miss your kids grow up in the process. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I now hate that statement. I understand that the intention was great with it. My, my rule that I go by now is I'm going to live as if I only have two years left, but plan as if I'll never die. I like that. Okay. So I want to live that way, which means that work is not the most important thing for, two, for if you're only going to live for two years, but work is important if you've got to have enough money to plan to live as if you'll never die. Okay. Okay. So I'm um, kind of pulling it all together. So in 2013, I went to my sister's wedding and her new brother-in-law looked at, uh, looked at me and told her, my sister said, your brother looks like my best friend who has a condition called acromegaly. He should go get checked out. Sure enough, I had the brain tumor that gave me acromegaly. 
So, it, you know, that, and it's always, you always find out, like you always think they always usually figure it out because uh, like dentists and um, orthodontists, they know what it looks like because it changes your jaw structure because your lower jaw keeps growing when it's not supposed to. Um, uh, oral or not oral, um, eye, eye, not eye surgeons, but the guys that check your eyes, optometrists, yeah. optometrists, they'll figure it out because if you start to have issues with eyesight, it's because there's pressure being put on that optical nerve. Okay. So there's certain things that start to happen that will, will cause that. But if you don't have, if no one points it out, you just, it happens so slowly, like, like the story of the frog in cold water that gets heated up, it gets, it gets rougher and rougher and rougher, but it's such a slow pace that you don't realize that there's something wrong. And so for me, what started happening is, um, my hair was really oily, which you have, which happens from a growth hormone or, or, um, too much growth hormone. My hands kept growing. So I have extra large hands. My nose kept growing, my eyebrows, my ears, my jaw, uh, my, my bone structure just got thicker on my body and I got wider and I was getting stronger until I had my injury. And then I never worked out after that really since then until recently. So I figured I had the sprain tumor. I went in, um, um, in May of 2013, it was like May 30th, May 31st. And I had my first brain surgery and I showed up to the top. Uh, it was, I'd show up at like 7 AM top of the Intermountain medical center, looking out of the Wasatch front mountain range. And, uh, I remember looking out on those mountains and realizing that they're going to go into my brain. They're going to go through my nose to the front of my brain to do operation. And if this doesn't go right, those mountains are the last thing I'll ever see. Wow. And it probably doesn't help that I watched the surgery on YouTube the night before. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. You would. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's funny. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> So I went in, had the surgery with in about for about a month, um, like as my nose is covering because I had to spend two days in ICU afterwards while they're monitoring everything because they they you know they put they what they do is they they actually cut the skin here on the nose and they disconnect the septum and move it to the side and that creates a highway right to the front of the brain wow. and they have to crack through two layers of skull inside. And then after they're done, they move the septum back in place, which I had, to, I had a crooked septum. So that actually was a good thing. I could actually breathe a lot better. So you had a nose job, you're, you're telling me. I got a nose job. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look prettier on the outside, but I can breathe better. There you go. <laughs> and um, so I got it, got it going. I could actually breathe a lot better afterwards. And um, it started healing up. I started to feel it a lot better. And then I started to feel like shit again. I mean, it was, and I called my doctor and he was like, dude, let's go get your, uh, let's do another MRI. Did the, another MRI. It was growing back. The tumor was growing back. Jeez. And, uh, and he said, all right, well, let's get you scheduled for surgery again. I, I recommend we going into it. So the pituitary gland is kind of like a pea like an actual size of a pea. It's not that big, but think of a, think of a wrinkled pea and having the brain tumor grow or the tumor grow all the way around it. And with one of those little, like, I don't know what they call it. It's a metal knife and they use that to scrape like your teeth and whatnot, but they, they can go in there and pull the cells out of the little crevices in, in the pea. That's what they were doing in my, inside my brain. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't want to touch the pituitary gland the first time because things it causes issues. But since they were having an issue with it growing back, they're like, okay, we're going to make sure we get it all this time. And so they got it, went in and get, got it all. And then I started to feel better for about a month. 
And then I started to really feel like shit again. So I went in and got all tested and come to find out that it knocked my pituitary gland out of service. My, nothing. My pituitary gland, pituitary gland did not work at all. Wow. Which meant that none of my hormones were being created. There was no thyroid. There was no testosterone. There was no growth hormone. My hair was starting to fall out. There was no, um, it's, I had to pee a lot. Your pituitary gland makes another hormone called, um, or well, that, that's actually classified as diabetes insipidus, which is type three diabetes and no one knows about it. It's a hormone that tells your body to release water out of your blood. And if you don't have this hormone, your body just starts releasing water out of your blood and then you, you can't stop peeing and you feel like you're dying of thirst. It's, I, I ran out of medication yeah. once and that was, that was a rough three hours. I, I, I was like, you know, we're going to find, if we don't find it, find a Walgreens and so forth so I can get this, you're going to take me to the ER and we're going to get this. Wow. There was no way I could go for, for very long. Um, the, uh, so the pituitary, pituitary, gland, pituitary gland got knocked out. I had to go in and get tested for everything and get put back on thyroid medication, testosterone, growth hormone, uh, prednisone, which is part which provides cortisol for your body. So I have to monitor all these things um, on my own. So, but to backtrack, when uh, when I went up to, for the second surgery, and I was again looking at that Wasatch Front Mountain Range, I, I stood there. I, I mean, I was there, and I was I had so much anxiety because I knew what was the recovery process was going to be, and I knew that I mean what. What's the likelihood of twice going into your brain that you're not going to have an issue coming out? Mm -hmm. And I made a commitment right then and there. If I make it through this, I'm going to change my life. I am no longer going to play the game of work for five years like no one else will so that you can do whatever you want after that. I'm going to live as if I only have two years left. And I'm going to live my life and find ways to work in the cracks. I want, uh, which meant that I could know, like if I wasn't, I, I vowed never to work nights and weekends again. Mm -hmm. as, as a common thing, right? Every once in a while, you got to do what you got to do. But I was no longer willing to work, and I could work nights and weekends, which meant that I had to change my career. I could no longer be a real estate agent because real estate agents always work nights and weekends. Yep. So I started, and so after I started recovering, and and I was already doing some flips here and there, but I didn't know that you could, you know, I didn't know that you could do a lot more of that. So I was looking at different things, and I was, you know, just asking questions. I ended up joining my first mastermind group, which I qual, which was called Collective Genius. I qualified for that through because of all all of my short sales I did, um, and they ended up teaching me how to market for for deals. And, and do deals in volume, like just straight seller. And so once I once I plugged into there, I had to negotiate a payment plan because I hadn't really worked in a year. And I'll be forever grateful for Jason Medley for helping me with that, working me through that. And they taught me how to be a true investor, how to, how to stop thinking like a service-oriented real estate agent and be in a, uh, a, um, a solid, smart businessman as an investor. And so I started to learn how to flip homes in volume. And I was, I started doing about r roughly 40 homes a year. Uh, I would, I would wholesale some, but I mostly rehabbed everything that, that I could get my hands on. And so I was doing them in Vegas and in Salt Lake area. And I was doing that for years. And I finally was able to turn in my real estate license and then and, and not work nights and weekends. I was finally able to take, uh, buy, you know, get the, the the toys, the razor, and the boat, and later on the motorcycles, and take my family on vacations, and actually not have to answer be on my phone the entire time. I was I was able to I actually sold a deal that uh, was an eightplex that I made a lot of money on and. And it was time to harvest it. And I told my wife, I said, all right, Brandy, I said, I'm going to give you a chunk of this money. 
and you can go, we can pick any vacation in the world you want to go on. And she's like, are you serious? Like for real? Like, you're not going to say this and then I'm going to go pick something out and then you're going to change your mind. Right. <laughs> but no, any vacation in the world you want to go on. And so, uh, Two years ago, we booked the trip for last May at this time, this this time last year. And we took a three and a half week trip to Europe and did a cruise and did a, visited all these countries around the Mediterranean and took the kids with us. And it's a, it ignited the desire to see the world and travel and learn new cultures, try new types of foods and uh, see that it's a different world outside the United States. And my kids who are now today, they're 13 and, and almost 16. So that was 12 and 15. So they're still young enough. They're old enough to remember it all and young enough to appreciate it and still want to be with mom and dad. So um, since then we've had a goal that every time a big deal closes that we do another trip like that. And so, I just closed the biggest deal of my career um, uh, a couple months ago, two months ago, uh, where it was about a half a million dollars on one deal with no partners. It was just us. So I uh, owned up for about a year and a half. And we're, so we're booking a trip to France to go do a castle tour. Amazing. We wanted to go to go, go to Egypt, but uh, it's not safe enough to go there right now, according to the U S embassy. So we're, we're going to France and we're doing some other things. So pretty exciting. So I guess, I guess I went forward a little bit, but what I'm saying, the whole thing with the brain tumor was I had to change my career. I had to change the way I work and, and work smarter, not harder. I got into the investor realm and I started flipping a bunch of homes and making a bunch of money. Um, but I, but I skipped a part that I need to come back to because I think it's really important, which is my path to mul the, my my path to cash flow, my path to multifamily. Um, so I was flipping a bunch of homes, and in you know 2018, 2019, like everybody and their dogs started to get into the game, right? They, everyone thought they were everybody was going to be a wholesaler. Everyone was flipping homes. And all of a sudden my app, because originally when I was marketing, my average cost for a deal was 2,500 bucks. It went up to over 15 grand per wow. deal to get it. And I'm like, this isn't worth it anymore. <laughs> it's not worth it. I need, so I was, so I tried to, sh to shift price points. I tried to do a couple of different things. And, um, <laughs> By 2019, we had an inverted yield curve. So I started to make less and less money. The inverted yield curve happened in September, September, October of 2019. So I knew we had a, a recession coming and I could already see the writing on the wall that I had four different deals that I was going to lose a bunch of money on. I didn't know how much, but I knew it was going to be more than I ever lost in my career. And I knew that the type of deals I was doing wasn't working anymore. The marketing that I was doing wasn't working anymore. I had to figure something else out. So out of, out of a little moment of weakness, I ended up getting my real estate license back thinking that I could go sell some homes again. <laughs> I, le I learned really quickly that that wasn't the right move. So after a year, I was like, okay, let's put that aside. Like I still kept it until about uh, three months ago, which, cause I haven't done a deal in about two years with it. Anyway, I finally turned it in, but I was like, what the, during that time, I was like, what am I going to do? Like what I'm doing isn't working anymore. What am I going to do now? I'm like, am I going to flip homes in another market? I got to go do I got to change markets. And I was like, well, if, if I'm going to change everything, what do I really want? Was the question I asked. What do I really want? And I was like, well, I want cash flow. I want reoccurring income for everything I do right now. And about that time, there was two uh, apartments that came up on a wholesale list hmm. up just north of me, about two and a half hours, uh, a, a 16 plex and a, an 11 plex, 27 doors. 
I'm like, well, if I'm going to do cash flow, that's what I need to buy. So I bought both of them. <laughs> Started rehabbing them, got it going. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all in. So I started marketing for multifamily in Pocatello, which is where I bought, it, uh, bought a ton of doors. And then I also marketed across Utah for more multifamily properties. Over the course of two years, I picked up 124 doors. Wow. What was your strategy? How, um, how were you able to do that? It was the, it was the Burr method. I was doing the Burr method on fourplex, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. I also did it on 20 plex. Uh, a 16 plex, an 11 plex, a six plex. Um, I just, um, I was, you know, I was, that, that's what I was doing. Except one, there was one little extra thing that I did. And um, I learned this from Corey with the way he structures debt on, or not debt, but equity on, on all the apartments, which is that six and six strategy. Yeah, which is essentially like. Well, a I already had a. It's, it's essentially like a debt, right? So what I started doing is I started putting second mortgages on all these properties, but I, if there, it, it, you know, I, I have 8% money and 10% money. And so I started structuring it where I split it up 4% or 5% money. I would pay quarterly and then the other money would accrue and I would do it for five years. And that allowed me to pull all my capital out of those problems sometimes. And I would do, um, uh, I would cash flow quite a bit. They would get cash flow every every quarter, and then they have a big payday on the back end that's coming out of equity. And what I found is that if I divided up that way, and I took the principal and interest payment on the first mortgage, and I had the the money that was accruing on their second mortgage, as long as the second mortgage that was accruing was less than the principal pay down on the first mortgage, I turned it into an interest only loan on a blended rate. Yeah which meant that I didn't have a negative end loan, which I didn't want. Right. And so, uh, you know, and so I just have to hold on for five years and let it cash flow, let the value build, let everything inflate like it does over the course of six years. It'll go up by 25% with basic inflation. Yep. And for those that aren't familiar with negative AM, um, that's essentially what a student loan is. It's, it's when you pay, essentially you're paying less than what is actually owed. And then it, just accrues even more over time. Um, well, if you want to go into the more, cra- yeah, I was going to say before the crap, before the crash, they were doing these negative AM loans where you only had to pay a portion of the actual payment. Yeah, yeah. there was a, they had a four option payment plan. There was an interest only one, and then there was a negative interest. And if you didn't pay it, then that interest got tacked on the back, and your principal balance was growing over time. And then when the real estate values crashed, that was a problem. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what they do with student loans too, which a lot of people don't realize. And that's, it's, right. it's dangerous, scary. But the Stafford loans. Yeah. 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 yeah but although anyways. I did buy my, although I did get my first education in real estate with student loans. <laughs> I'd love to hear that one day. Uh, I, I, no, I bought my, I bought my first rich dad, poor dad set off of the TV for 250 bucks with no, my student loan money. I love it. <laughs> They were all CDs. I still have them. That's smart. I love um, so, yeah. So I started buying all these multifamily properties. I was doing the firm method. I was pulling money out at the same time. And then every once in a while I'd wholesale one. And then uh, afterwards the, uh, and then 2022 rolled around. I'd already kind of finished like with that whole, with as many as I could possibly do at the time. Everything I found, I bought unless I wholesaled it. And then um, the rates went up, and so and the pricing went real, went sky high too. So it didn't really make sense to buy anymore for a time. And so I was like, "Well, if I, what do I what do I want to do now?" And so I shifted to storage units. And so last year I bought three storage unit facilities with two, with uh, with a partner, and uh, and then we brought on another partner after the fact. And then we're under contract to buy another, another property in Florida right now that we're going through the process on. We got quite a few properties that we're looking at. So storage units, one of the things that most people don't know is that it's, 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 I forget the term for it. Um, 
It's basically a buying a business that happens to own real estate too. That's a special type of interest, like a mobile home park or an RV park, uh, storage units, where the value is actually in the business, but you need the real estate to operate that business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas apartments can you, you and the, the, the value is in the building itself, regardless of who's managing it. Now, obviously you can improve the value by management uh, and improve the value by doing certain things, but there's more value in just the real estate itself than in the business. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. Um, and so 65% of all, of all storage unit facilities right now are owned by mom and pops. And I believe that, uh, um, all like the majority of those are going to be gobbled up by people like myself and like others that I know that are, that are buying several a year and accumulating them. And then we'll just flip them to a REIT in five, 10 years and have a big payout. But 65% of those mom and pops, most of them will be gobbled up over the next 20 years. And it'll be more like the hotel business in the, in the beginning in the hotel business, they were all owned by individuals. Mm -hmm. But then big companies started acquiring and accumulating hotel, lots of hotels. And so now it's more common that a hotel is owned by a large REIT or a large corporation, large hedge fund than a mom and pop. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I think we just saw the largest acquisition ever in the storage space earlier this year. Don't quote me on this, yeah. but I believe it was extra space who bought public storage, which is something like a 12 $12 billion deal, which is massive. Yeah. It I was kind of, it, it was kind of a hostile takeover to be honest. Was it? I don't know. They, the, they I don't know the forced details. the sale. They forced it. Oh, okay. Okay. They're like you don't want to sell. We're just going to take over. <laughs> we're just going to buy all your, buy all your stock. <laughs> all right. So uh, wow. Okay. At, least, at least I think it was that one. I, I should not I miss. I, I should probably, I could have, I probably misspoke on that. So don't quote me on that, but I heard on the grapevine that they didn't have a choice. Yeah, I could see that happening. And, but to your point, I think you're absolutely right because two, three years ago, I remember that the stat was like 80 something percent were owned by mom and pop. And now you're saying what, 65 or whatever it is. So it's already 65%. Gone down. It's gone it, down it, like it, 20%. it was in 2012 is 85%. Okay. And so every year more and more get gobbled up and the percentage also grows because more, all the new ones that are being built are immediately going to hedge funds and REITs. Yep. Yep. And those are popping up like crazy, especially the, yeah. they don't even look like a traditional storage anymore. Um, just looks like a big, big box that they make look a little prettier on the outside. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the so yeah, I mean, so that's that. So I, I told you my story and I'm, I've told that story a lot. I get up on stage and tell that story. So I'm not really used to questions in that. So I just kind of just, just told the whole thing, but, but what, uh, as far as like my health journey and where that's taken me, what questions do you have there? Well, to me, it, it or, this is, this has been like, um, I would say, it's about being flexible. It's about pivoting. That kind of seems like the, the theme of this story, right? Like, you know, a lot, I think a lot of times people have a vision of where they want to go and they lay out some path and they, they get blindsided, they put blinders on and they feel that's the only way to get to that goal. Um, whereas it seems like in your story, yeah, you had a goal of eventually you realized the goal was spending less time in work and more time with your family, but still making, the adequate income to support the type of lifestyle, but your story, instead of focusing on, you know, flipping, some people would think that's the only way to get there. Then you went to multifamily and that served you and then until it didn't. And then now you're in storage. So to me, I guess what's, so it seems like a lot of people just get stuck on one thing and they feel it's the only thing. Yes. They might have some shiny object syndrome, but they, they still just stay committed to that one thing. What's allowed you to be able to, be flexible and try new things out and also excel in those new things as well. Um, that's a good question. There's always waves. Like there's a wave of people that get into something and a wave of people that get out. And then there's a small percentage that they get in there and that's where they stay their whole career. Yep. 
for the people that stay their whole career, over half the time, it's a rough go. And then the other half of the time, it's amazing. But I like to go where the sweet spot is in every industry during its wave. And then it, when it's time to switch. And I also look at it as every time that I shift, because I've had to shift every three to four years. So like I got into the real estate business in 2004 as an agent. And I was working with sphere of influence, mostly with buyers. And then 2007, 2008, I had to shift really hard. I was forced to shift. If I didn't change what I was doing, I would, I would go bankrupt. I, I would be out of the game and a lot of my friends did. So I did short sales and I did that clear up until 2013. And I remember that at that point in time, cause I could see the end coming for that game. I could see it on the wall. As soon as I was getting approval letters, and at the same time as I get approval letter on a short sale, I also got a loan modification approval letter and my seller had to, had to try for the modification before they would allow it to be short sold. As soon as I realized that the banks were trying to keep people in their homes instead of letting them go, I'm like, this game's over. Yeah. yeah. I bet like, it's a, it, this is over. What am I going to do now? And then I went to flipping and flipping actually lasted longer because it went, I mean, I started in tw- you know, basically 2010 and I went and it was heavy until 2019, 2018, really just slowed real, way down into 2019. And then, and it, but every time I know I need to shift, I try multiple things. Like in 2019, I went and tried to do some stuff in Puerto Rico and I actually ended up buying a, uh, a property in Puerto Rico is right on the ocean in Dorado. Great location. I was going to convert this sevenplex into a fourplex so that I can get, uh, uh, you know, Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac financing on it and do Airbnb with every unit. And it was right on the ocean on three quarters of an acre. Wow. Um, I bought it for 250,000 and then because it had been hit by the hurricane. Uh, but I could not find anybody to work on it that didn't want to charge me five hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to remodel it. Jeez. Like, like after, like people, it, it was like I was the gringo and I was I was a big target. And I'm like, dude, you guys want to charge me uh, like two hundred fifty, two hundred dollars a square foot to remodel this thing when I can go buy a go build a brand new home for 150 bucks a square foot in Salt Lake. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> no, you're not getting the job, but we did all this work. I said, I don't care. You're over, you're overcharging me. And I also, I think that's a common trend out there in, in Puerto Rico, which is why nothing gets fixed because everybody, if they're not making a grip on it every time, they, they, they won't, they'd rather not work at all. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up, I ended up selling the property for more than I bought it for. I bought it for two forty. I ended up selling it for like two sixty seven. But after closing costs and commissions and money costs, and everything, I ended up down about fifteen grand. But I made that decision. Oh, and I sold that. It was like April second of twenty twenty. Oh wow! We went to close on that. And then, and then the title companies closed for like a week and then they opened up for a little bit and then we got it closed. It was a cash deal. And then they closed everything down again. Wow. So, and I, and I moved all that money to Pocatello on, on the, on the new apartments that we're, we're acquiring. And so I spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico and I realized that's not the game I want to play. In fact, I don't want to have to hop on a plane to go see my property. Yes. At that time, like I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to hop on a plane. And so that's why I focused on Pocatello because I can get the same returns as I could in other places in the country because that, that market had not cranked up yet. Apparently I was at the very beginning of that wave. Um, and then 2020, I was like, all right, let's pick this, this multifamily wave. I, I wanted to do big apartments, but I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't want to go raise a ton of money at that time. I didn't feel like I could. I also didn't want to hop on a plane and travel across the country to go look at properties. Um, I was finally getting, uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to do it. Um, especially after that Puerto Rico uh, issue I had with that property. And I'm like, where, what can I do locally? So then that's why I chose there. And I ran that 
I, I ran that gold vein until the gold vein ran. I, I couldn't do any more. But at that point in time, I could really choose to do whatever. I could go flip some homes again. But, you know, I ended up with 24 grand a month in cash flow. And then I refinanced some cash out so that we could do some vacations and go on um, um, remodel our house and, you know, do those kind of things like live as if we only have two years left. Yep. Because what m- most people do is they, they grab all these properties and they're like, okay, we can spend money on this in 30 years. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, actually I'm going to harvest that one right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to do it while I can right now. Yeah. I, I want to do it while I can. I want to live an amazing life because the way I look at it is I only had five years left with both my kids home. So I got one kid that's going to be going to college in three years and another one in five. And wow. so I'm trying to fit as much stuff into that period of time as I can. Cause I'll, I'll, I'll always make money. It's, it's, it's like working out and it's a skill. And once you learn the skill, you'll always make money. So I know I could always make more money later on and I'll have a lot more time to do it later on too. Maybe I'll learn some new skills by then. Maybe I'll, I'll learn from you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> hey man. But, um, so it's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's why I, I've been harvesting a few of them and taking the money now and live, trying to live an amazing life. And, and that's not what financial planners would tell me to do, but they also haven't had a brain tumor either. And they haven't had a health scare like I have either. And so we're trying to make, we're trying to, trying to live an amazing life. And I know that this, this storage unit career, I think that this is going to last a decade but it could only be three or four years until I'm on to the next thing. Yeah. Well, that's the fun part of life. Buying, probably buying businesses. You know, I'm already looking at some of those, but, but it would be businesses that complement the storage unit game. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway, there's dude, life is so fun when you look, when you realize it's all a game. It is though. It is. And that, I love, that's what I love about it. And that's why I love talking to people like you on this podcast. I love idea sharing and you know, it's, it it is what's fun about life. And so it's great about this country too, that we have the opportunity to do this. Um, Mm -hmm. but I love man. And so it sounds like we're, we got the, maybe the, the pitcher holding companies coming soon where you're just buying up different companies and, and storage facilities. Uh, That's possible. I love it. (laughs) No, that's, that's great. And I think, Another theme of this of this show is that it's always good to have skills to fall back on. I'm sure that gives you confidence. Like I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I could see how that gives you confidence to go try a new thing, knowing that you already have these built built up skills that you could always fall back on if it doesn't doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I learned I've learned the shortcuts. Like if I want to go flip houses, I know how to market for those and get houses. And I know where to get go get the money from. It's a lot of once you learn how to raise money to do deals, whether it's a whether it's an apartment deal. Uh, actually, I probably if I like if I had to make a million dollars in one year, yeah. What would if you I do? Had to do that. If I had to do that, I would go find and flip an apartment. I would go market and prospect, run the numbers on an apartment, find a buyer for it, flip it, and make a million bucks. Or maybe I have to do four of them and get a quarter million on each one. I'd just assign those things. Yeah. I realize that there are so many deals out there and there are, and, and there, once people get to a certain, like, it's funny. I, I noticed the hustle changes. Like once people get into commercial real estate, they hustle less. Really? It's, it's weird. They hustle less. They spend more time. And I'm, okay. I'm not saying there's a problem with this. I've just noticed it's different. When in the single family game, you got guys that are out there willing to knock doors and prospect and market and network and do all these different things to try and accumulate deals. Once you start doing big deals and you only need a couple of them a year, most investors will just go to the brokers that specialize in that area and that and find deals from the brokers because the brokers are hustling. 
Right. Most of the investors quit hustling and go and direct to seller. There's very few investors that go direct to seller in the commercial game. I agree with that. There's obviously so that, that, there's factors, like, but I agree with that. There's factors, right? But I, and part of it is the, the, the investors like, I don't want to spend my time prospecting or marketing or taking all those calls or whatnot. I'd rather just get a full package from a broker that's already done all that work and they get paid a fee for that. Yeah. Which in some scenario, uh, you're going to have to live an amazing life by doing that. You pay some fees, but as long as the deal, the numbers work, the numbers work. But if you can go direct to seller, if you're willing to market and prospect and go direct to seller and pull all those numbers, well, you're able to negotiate some much better terms uh, because sometimes the brokers just get in the way. Yeah. And less fees. And less fees, right? Less fees. But, um, Right now, part of that is sellers don't know what their real price is. If they get something they're happy with, they're good. No different than in the single family game. Some people, uh, but some people don't really care if they get the maximum price. It matters what's important to them. Some like in the single family game, there are sellers like, yeah, I know I could get more if I want to list it and deal with the pain in the ass of doing that. I'd rather just, if I want a buyer that's going to buy it and they're going to buy it next week and I'm done. Yeah. There are, there are some sellers like that in the commercial game as well. They don't want to jump through all those. They'd rather just have it done. Or, or they don't have the ability to put together all the paperwork the brokers want. And so the bro- they'll never get it lifted. So if they found a buyer that can work through that differently than most buyers, then, then, then you got a deal. Yeah. Like with the one where we're, we're looking at right now in Florida, they don't have all the paperwork. Yeah, and that's it's not yeah. until we went and helped them do it that we could get our paperwork. And that's your opportunity too, that they don't have those records, right? So they don't really know what right. it's valued. Yeah. Right. Which is why we're getting on seller financing. Oh, I love that. Because we can't get a loan. <laughs> that's good though, right? At first it seems like, oh man, I can get a loan on this, but that's good because then you can, neg- the only way for them to sell is seller financing and you can kind of dictate the right. terms. Yeah. Right. Have you, have you done a lot of so, seller financing in the past? A lot of it. Yeah. But it's always been on, on uh, either single family or small multifamily, but I haven't done seller financing yet on, on these big deals. So we're, we're excited to get one under our belt oh, on great. this one. Have a, have a balloon payment on it? Yeah. Most, of, most everybody wants to get their money in five years. Yeah. Well, well, they're trying for a year or two and we're always pushing for a five. Right. 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 More time, the better to figure it out. Yeah. Well, we, we, well, we want enough time to, to be able to get three years of tax returns. Yeah. So then you can go put, put uh debt on it. Yeah. So either we're putting debt on it or we're selling it to someone who's going to put debt on it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Smart. So, um, yeah, man, I like to catch it. Like for me, because I always like when most people, when things don't go well and they're, and they're, they're frustrated, they're losing money left and right. They're having a really rough time. Most people put their head in the sand and they feel sorry for themselves and Sometimes they'll stay there for way too long. Yep. I'm not saying you can't feel sorry for yourself because everyone gets the, gets kicked in the nuts every once in a while. Yeah, that's true. Right. But when things aren't going rough and if it's a, a, a total economy thing, like everybody's getting kicked in the nuts, the best thing that you can do is look up, look around and see what's going on because there's usually an opportunity right in front of you that nobody else has seen. And, and because there's still people that have to buy, there's still people that have to sell and there's still deals that will be done regardless of the economy. And, you know, then the, right now there's a financing problem because the rates are so high. Well, that creates opportunities too. If you look for it or you could, you know, feel sorry for yourself and go put your head in the sand. So every time things get rough, I always poke my head up and I want to see what's going on in it. And like for storage units, I know like, 
for large multifamily deals when I was looking again in 20, um, 2018, 2019, because I did Corey Peterson's first Kahuna boardroom. I want to say it was 2018, 2017, 2018, right around in there, where I kind of learned, okay, here's what you look for. Here's how you do it. But I was, but I wasn't ready to start doing that. And then when I was ready to start doing cash flow, I felt like I was too late to the game on that one. At least where there's a big, where there's a big basketball going through a garden hose. I felt like I was late. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but I feel like I was late in the in in the wave that was coming through. And I and I and I picked like being in all the masterminds and seeing what everybody's doing. Everyone was doing apartments and big apartments. They were trying to find apartments. Like, okay, well, what is everyone not doing? Well, I, th- I think that the biggest opportunities right now are in um, mobile home parks, RV parks, and storage units. Why do you think that? Because is that ju- just mo- a lot of mom and pops still concentrated there? A lot, a lot of mom and pops. Yeah. And, and you're starting to hear more pe- about more people doing them. But not everybody's doing that. And I think over the next five, 10 years, everyone's going to be doing storage units, mobile home parks, and RV parks. Yeah, kind of like what's happening in multifamily. Mm-hmm, exactly. Exactly what's happening in multifamily is exactly what's going to happen with those. I, I remember like some people were wholesaling back in 2013, 2014, 2015. And then all of a sudden, everybody was a wholesaler in 2018. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone had the, we, we buy, ha- we buy houses signs everywhere. Yeah. Everybody, everybody. And everyone's like, are you wholesaling? Are you like, and then there was the Daisy chains and, but you know, I'm not saying that everyone's wrong in that. I'm just saying that that's not the path that I choose to take. I would rather go play a game where there's way less people. There's way, you know, there's usually more opportunity and sometimes you're early to the game. Um, but I usually find if I fall, if I, if I see an opportunity somewhere, I usually figure out that I want to try to be more at the beginning of that opportunity than at the end. And if I feel like I'm at the beginning of it, I know that I have usually three or four years before it gets, before it gets crowded. Yep. And then when it starts to get crowded, that's when I'm exiting and finding the next wave. Yeah. Easier to catch a wave when you're early. Right. Yeah. No, I'm, so, I'm with- and if you can add a, and if you can add a zero or two, that's always better too. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we can go on more trips and buy more toys. Right. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, this has been a phenomenal episode, Brian. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but before I let you go, if I could just ask one last question, kind of, um, yeah. you know, what is, you've obviously been in the real estate business for a very long time. You've probably met a ton of people, seen successes, seen failures. What's kind of a common theme you've seen in people that just don't make it. And, and, and what are some things that people can do to hopefully not fall in those, those pitfalls? Ooh, what do I, what do I find common that people that, that fail? Yeah. What's a common denominator for people that fail? And then on the flip side, after you answer that, what's a common denominator for people that succeed? Well, yeah, well, it's the same thing. It's limiting beliefs. Yeah. Like they don't think they can do it, and so they don't. They're 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 tell, you know they're telling themselves the truth. They don't think they can do it, and they're right. They can't. On the on the and the only way that you can the best way in my opinion, to change uh, the belief from I can't do this or I don't know if I can do this to, oh, I can do that, is to go surround yourself with a ton of people that are doing that. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's all most the, – the struggle that most people have isn't actually the work. It's not actually their skill sets. Because skill set, the work can be learned, the skill sets can be learned. You know, experience experience comes from when things don't go right. Yeah, and you have to, and you learn from that. Um, the thing that can't that that people can't learn until they uh, choose to is 
what's going on in the six inches between their ears. Oh man. A lot. Like if, if you're not, yeah, it's a lot, right? Well, it's all, and it's all usually about the bullshit that, that our, that our parents taught us or, well, it's not, I mean, 90% of life is about, or 10% of life happens to you. And 90% of life is the story that you created about what happened to you. That's so true. Right. So, you know, all these things that, that happened to us as we were growing up. And it's not even about what happened. It's a story that we created on why, on, on why, as a uh, Tommy boy puts it, why I suck as a salesman. <laughs> great movie, great reference. <laughs> or, or why, why I'm not good enough. Why am I, why am I not good enough? Why, you know, where, why am I such a failure in life? Why do I always fail? And part of that is our, our American way of, our schooling, our schooling tells you you're bad if you, if you're not perfect. Yeah. Right. And you're trying to be perfect in grades. And anytime you're not perfect, you're bad and you're punished. When in reality, failure is the best, is the best motivator. It's the best learner. You learn from failure. The more, the faster you fail, the more you learn and the more you learn. Like you need to fail fast. And, but most people can't get to that point because of all the stories that they tell themselves in their head. I'm so, I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid of what other people think. Um, I'm afraid that my, you know, I have a friend that is that, um, and I've talked to him about this in person that one of the reasons why he's sabotaging himself from being successful is because when he was young, he told himself, he, t- he said that he always hated people that were rich. Mm. He hated people that were rich because he assumed that they got it in by ripping people off or yeah. manipulating people or t- doing it in not honest ways. Well, now that he has the opportunity to become rich or wealthy, it is in a direct violation of his core belief system. Yeah. Wow. And so, so every time he does something good, he slides backwards because of that belief system and until he changes that belief system, which he's now aware of, he, he's not going to be able, any money he makes, he won't keep it because of that core belief. So, I mean, learning, you know, I mean, Tony Robbins is who really got me into the self-development and finding out what's going on up here. Yep. But then since then it's been lots of, you know, therapy and energy work and, and doing some of the uh, plant-based medicine and like really trying to figure out what's going on up here and get rid of those limiting beliefs and realize that there's millions of possibilities and everything that's ever happened to you happened for you, not to you and, and find the, find, find the good in it because everything that happened to you is good for you because if you learn from it. Right regardless of what it is. So for me, it took me a little while, but I, but now I have a firm belief. My brain tumor is the best thing that ever happened to me. That's amazing. Cause it changed the way I view the world and it changed the way I am. I am with my family. It saved me from not having a relationship with my kids when they grow up. Wow, that's it powerful. saved me from myself. So my brain tumor is the best thing that ever happened to me. Very powerful, man. That's, I, I think that's, that's a mic drop right there. I think we can just wrap, <laughs> wrap it up right here. <laughs> that's, you know, yeah, I can't end, I can't think of ending the show in a better way than that. So I just want to th- thank you for your time, my friend. This has been wonderful. Okay. You're welcome, man. Good to see All you, brother. Right. I'm going to see you. All right, everybody. Yeah. As always, easy doesn't pay well and instant gratification is self-destructive. So not only get out there and work hard for your money, but have it work hard for you. Then you can create an amazing life like Brian has and we can all make this world a better place. All right, catch on the next one. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, 
I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.